Good morning. I greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so good to see everyone. I welcome you all here uh, to Church of the Redeemer's first ever outdoor worship service here on our campus. Friends, it's been 12 weeks since we last met together, and I know that every one of us is thankful uh, to our great God and King for this special opportunity to worship the Lord's Day on simply what is a beautiful, beautiful morning that God has created. As we begin, I'd like to first of all thank all of our elders, our deacons, our staff, and our many, many volunteers who made a, a day like this possible. A lot went into making this happen, and uh, I know we're all grateful for the, the time, energy, and effort to make that happen. Friends, obviously things are a little bit different today. Uh, we do appreciate your willingness to, to stay uh, physically distant and to keep your family members together. We want you to know that our building is open for the re for, to use the restroom. If you need to uh, enter, the, enter the building, you can do that one of two ways. Here to my left, just go in on this end of the, of the building, or here to my right on that end of the building, and you can access uh, the, the restrooms that way. Friends, I want you to know that all parts of worship today uh, have been made available to you electronically. So if you want, just open up the email that you received on Friday, uh, the core weekly email, and you can uh, have access to several different links. There's a link to our bulletin, the scriptures we're going to use today, our corporate readings, the lyrics to our songs, and even the children's worksheets. But if you don't want to use electronic means, please know that we do have a bulletin available for you. It's here at this table uh, to my left. A, a deacon will happily uh, give you a bulletin if you need that. And again, you will need that today because we do have the lyrics of the songs in there as well as some uh, corporate readings together. So please make sure to get a bulletin. It's going to help you unless you want to use the electronic means. Friends, Redeemer exists to exalt our Lord Jesus Christ, and we do that by gathering those from our community, which we're doing in a very special way today. Of course, grounding in the gospel, growing into disciples, and then going together to make disciples of all nations. If you're here, maybe for the first time you're visiting with us, we're delighted you're here. We invite you to visit our website at RedeemerWeb.com, and you can Go to the About Us tab and fill out some visitor information. We'd love to hear about you. Also, feel free to email us or call us with any questions you have. Well, friends, we're here today uh, to worship the Lord. And with that in mind, I want to call us to worship 
from reading Psalm 100, I invite you to stand with me and honor the reading of God's holy word. Psalm 100, the word of God says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, and His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness endures to all generations. Friends, let us now make a joyful noise. Let us come before His presence with singing. Please join us as we sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Just in more. 
Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we come on this beautiful morning that you have created. And we come, Lord, to declare your glory, to sing your praises, to worship you this Lord's day. Our God and King, we thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, that even though we've been apart for, for 12 weeks, we thank you for this opportunity to gather again on the Lord's day to worship and exalt the triune God. And Father, this day we ask your blessings upon all parts of this service, from our singing, our praying, our giving, the preaching of your word. Lord, may all parts of, of worship honor and glorify you today. Lord, as your word goes forth today, we know, as you promised in your word, it will not return unto you void. We pray that you would do a work in our hearts, Father, and enable us to follow uh, harder after the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, Lord, if there is one under the sound of my voice today who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we pray for that one today, that you would draw him or her savingly to yourself, that he or she would come to know Jesus as Savior and as Lord. Father, may we as believers uh, worship you in spirit and in truth this day. May you be honored and glorified. We ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for your patience with me as I turn these pages. It's a little windy up here. We have to keep everything kind of down. But friends, our supplemental scripture reading today comes from two books of the Bible. The first from Mark chapter 4. It's the story that Jesus tells of the sower and the seed. And the second comes from Isaiah chapter 55, speaking of the Word of God. So here now, the written Word of God. First of all, Mark chapter 4. The Lord Jesus is speaking when He says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it immediately sprang up, but since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. A little further on in the chapter, Jesus says, The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those who were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And now from Isaiah chapter 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Praise be to the Lord our God to be able to hear His Word this morning. Friends, we come now to that time of...
confession of sin. Friends, it is so good to be in the habit of praying the scriptures. And I want you to always be encouraged to pray the scriptures back to the Lord. When we think about the Psalms, we're we're thinking about those who are really writing devotionals to the Lord, many times prayers to the Lord. And friends, today as we come to confess our sin to a holy God, I want to invite you to join with me in praying Psalm 130, verses 1 through 6. Again, the words are in your bulletin. It's also on the link that you could pull up on your, on your smartphone. But we're going to pray together and hear each other's voices that we, as we corporately call out to the Lord today in confession, Psalm 130, verses 1 through 6. So let's now go and pray this prayer of confession together to our God. Pray with me. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Amen. And friends, the beautiful picture of this psalm is that not only is our confession found in Psalm 130, but our assurance of pardon comes from the next two verses, verses 7 and and eight. And today, I want you to be assured of the pardon that we have through our great God and King. The Word of God says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for, the, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with Him is plentiful redemption. And He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. How wonderful it is to have the pardon, the forgiveness of the Almighty God. Well, friends, as we come now to prepare for giving, I want you to know that giving will be done a little differently today, I think for obvious reasons. Instead of passing a basket as we usually do, uh, we have set baskets on this, this table to my left. Um, so at the end of today's service, as you leave, you can put your offering in this basket on your way out. Or if you'd like, you can continue to give online at our website, RedeemerWeb.com, or you can simply mail in your giving to our church address. But friends, as we consider giving, as we prepare to give even today, let's remember 1 Chronicles 16, 29, which says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name, and bring an offering, and come before Him. Friends, I encourage you to ponder this verse today, especially as you exit and go back to your cars. But for now, let's continue to worship the Lord by standing and singing together, His mercy is more. Our patience 
whispered wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest of all as the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the death we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the be seated. I have a couple of announcements for us. The first is please pray that the wind does not blow over my guitar as you were seated there. That would be much appreciated. Um, Two quick announcements. Uh, The first is seniors you did it congratulations you have graduated yeah let's give it up for them we just want to recognize our 2020 graduating high school seniors we know that uh, this was the most bizarre graduation of all time and in many ways it's just sad uh, for your final uh, semester to to look the way it did but uh, we just want to acknowledge uh, you. So if you are here and I call your name, please, uh, please stand. Uh, Cora Eisman, Sam Emmerich, Rachel Johnson, Samuel Johnson, Joshua Reimer, Karis Reimer, Carolina Sperry, Elizabeth Timberlake. Keep standing if you're here. And let's give it up for you, these guys. Thank you for persevering. We're excited for you guys in the next chapter of your life. And then uh, second announcement is... Um, Immediately following this service, five minutes after the service ends, we will have a five-minute meeting, and it's, it's an interest meeting for an upcoming mission trip. Uh, and so this is very exciting. It's an adult mission trip, which as a church, we have not had one of these in quite a while. Um, so I would like to invite all of you uh, to join us for five minutes, a five-minute meeting that will take place five minutes after service ends. Uh, in person, if you want to meet, we will be in the, the foyer here, uh, so you can just make your way into the foyer, but we will also be streaming it uh, virtually, so if you are not comfortable uh, coming into the foyer, you can still tune in. In the description of the, the live feed online, you should see a link for a Google Hangout, a Google Meet, and you can, you can tune in that way, um, and also the link is in the Core Weekly. So you can find the link. It's only a five-minute meeting. And I would encourage many of you, um, even if you don't particularly think you will go, to maybe tune in just to know what our church is doing, how you can pray. But the meeting, uh, the meeting is about a mission trip that we are still planning to take to Atlantic City, New Jersey. 
and it will be August 8th through 15th, and uh, we will be uh, partnering with New City Fellowship, which is a church plant uh, pastored by Peter Eck. And uh, not only will Peter Eck be there and his church, but also Andrew Holbrook and Myla Shepherd from Christ Church Fairfield, Connecticut, is sending a team to partner with us. So here are two very great reasons why you should consider coming. The first is that if you come, you will be able to partner with not only one, but two of the churches that, uh, church plants that we support. That's Peter Eck and Andrew Holbrook's church. Um, and the second reason, I'll read you the purpose of the, the mission trip. Um, sorry about that. Um, the, the purpose of the mission trip is for leadership development, and it will equip uh, your youth group deacons or church leadership with a vision for racial reconciliation, ministry among the poor, and joy and, and worship in the heart of Atlantic City's inner city. And so um, racial reconciliation, ministry among the poor, and joy and worship in the heart of Atlantic City. And I would just like to say, in just a moment, Teve is going to pray for this particular issue, but as many of you know, this this past week and the weeks prior to this have truly been just, just tragic uh, in terms of uh, the injustice that we have seen, the, the killing of George Floyd. And I think, if nothing else, the recent events show that as a church, there is still much work to be done for us to learn uh, learn how we can love and minister to our minority brothers and sisters and grieve with them. And so one objective of this trip is there will be training in racial reconciliation. And so I would encourage each of you to search your own hearts, consider if this could be something that you, your family, or someone you know could uh, benefit from. So again, five minutes after the service ends, we will have a five-minute meeting right here and virtually. Thank you very much. Morning, morning, Redeemer. Uh, good to be with you all in person this morning. I know it's been difficult with the quarantine, and there's been many different emotions about that. But uh, I will say, I think in the midst of all that, that Redeemer has been a blessing uh, in getting the gospel of grace out as we've met virtually. So I thank God for that. Um, as Hunter mentioned, it's been uh, an emotional last several days in our country. Um, and so I think it's important as the church that we speak into that and pray through that, um, as many church leaders have already started to do from multiple backgrounds. Um, so I'm going to spend time just praying and sharing uh, about everything that's been going on over the last few days. And let me just uh, share a couple scriptures before I start praying. This is from 1 Corinthians 12. 25 through 26, it says that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one, su if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Jesus says in John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Ephesians 2, 14, Paul writes, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. You're a great and merciful God. You're the God of all flesh. You're a God of judgment, of justice, of love, of reconciliation, Lord. And so we come before you uh, just corporately as a body here at Redeemer. Lord, it's hard, I will confess, to stand up here as an African-American male and just be uh, transparent and open with my emotions, but I love my Redeemer family dearly, uh, and they've been a blessing to us, and I love your church, and I love you, God, and so I will confess that as I watch the video... <laughs> this... This past week, of an African-American male who's my age being subdued 
and dying in the midst of that interaction, that there was fear, uh, that there was that I grieved, that there was anger, uh, that there was hopelessness, in some ways isolation. And I just put that before you and before my brothers and sisters in Christ and just pray that you would grant me the grace to work through those emotions, Lord. I pray at this time as a church locally here at Redeemer and as a church universal, Lord, that we would continue to be at the forefront and that we would speak into this and that we would just continue to pray, that we would look for real opportunities for, for dialogue, to be slow to speak and quick to listen, uh, to put away all of our biases, whatever background and perspective we come from, Lord, and just work through all this in a loving manner. Uh, I pray for our law enforcement, Lord. I, I pray that you would guard us against the sentiment that all law enforcement people are bad, Lord. And I thank you specifically. I want to pray specifically for those that are tied to Redeemer, Lord. I thank you for Officer AJ and for the Union County Sheriff's Office, Lord, and, and just the way that they've worked with us and protected our building. I thank you for those connected to our families, Lord, for Shepherd Deese. And I thank you for and pray for uh, Janie and Todd's son-in-law, uh, Jared, who I believe is on the SWAT team in Charlotte, Lord. I know that these are good men, Lord, and I know that there's many good men and women who serve. And I pray that you would just grant them the grace to continue to uh, police uh, in an effective manner, Lord. Uh, I think about the friend of one of my daughters down the street whose father is a sheriff, Union County Sheriff's deputy, and she's fearful of telling people what he does because of concerns about backlash, Lord. So we pray for, for them, and we look at this as the need for healing, that people are angry, that people are emotional, and we pray that we would proceed in a godly and in a peaceful manner. And I would just close in this. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So we bring this before you in Christ's name. Amen. To my brother T, the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you, brother, for your transparency, your honesty before us. We love you dearly. And to all of us as a church, I want not only to echo what Hunter has said, what T has said and prayed before the Almighty God, but I will say before us all, as a church, we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. We have to love our brother. We have to love our neighbor as ourselves. And with that in mind, I want you to pray for our session meeting this coming Wednesday. Because this coming Wednesday, our elders are going to have the opportunity to come together uh, to discuss this issue and many other issues surrounding this. And we, um, as a leadership, Lord willing, will we'll make not only a statement about this, but uh, moving forward, we want to create a, a culture of, of dialogue, a, a culture of loving our brother and our sister in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Hunter and Teve, thank you for, for leading us this morning. Uh, Teve, especially for that prayer. And please be in prayer, uh, dear friends, for our leaders this coming Wednesday. Well, friends, as we now turn our attention to the preaching of God's holy word, we're going to continue our study in 1 Thessalonians. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 13 through 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. If, you're, if you are able, I invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's holy word. As Daryl says many times, Paul writes, 
but God speaks. We also, or, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But the wrath of God, but the wrath has come upon them at last. Friends, please pray with me. Our God and Heavenly Father, as we come to your word uh, this beautiful Lord's Day, as we come to the preaching portion of it, Lord, I pray specifically today that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the word. Today, God, we're talking all about the reception of the Word of God. And I pray, God, that we would properly receive it, that, that you would prepare our hearts, open us to receive it. Let us, as Jesus said, be um, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, Lord. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Remove every distraction from this place for those here uh, in our parking lot and for those who are watching online, that we might focus on your Word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Storytelling. You know, for centuries and even millenniums, people have always loved to hear a good story. You know, I can remember as a child growing up in East Tennessee, my mom or my dad, they would tell me stories about their childhood. Or maybe from time to time they would tell me an old folk tale. I just love to hear stories. And even in East Tennessee, where I grew up, you might be familiar with this. But in East Tennessee, there was an annual storytelling festival every single year in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Does anyone know about that? Um, I, I can remember that professional storytellers would come from all over the world to Jonesboro for for days. And people would line up, cars would line up to get into the parking lot to hear these stories. I I can remember being a fifth grader in the spring of 1988 going to to Jonesboro and and hearing all these stories, and that left a, a big impact on my life. Well, friends, did you know that stories are even very important to preachers? You know, I've been preaching now for about 21 years, and I can testify to you that when someone comes up to me and and maybe makes a comment about the sermon, it's usually about a story I've told in the sermon. You know, it's, it's not usually about the parsing of a Greek verb that I might have talked about or the difference between two theological concepts. They don't really remember that as much as I'd like them to. They usually talk about, hey, Adam, let's Talk about the time you hit yourself in the nose or the time you went the wrong way down a one-way street. They remember stories. Well, friends, I tell you about stories and storytelling because in the same fashion as of of all preachers, the, the greatest preacher that I've ever known, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, he was a storyteller. And maybe he told stories because he knew people would remember the stories. But you see, Jesus wasn't just a storyteller. He was the master storyteller. In fact, Jesus used stories all the time in the Gospels when he wanted to teach us. Think about this. When Jesus wanted to teach about salvation, he told the story of a lost sheep, of a lost coin, Or a lost son. When Jesus wanted to teach about wisdom and folly, he told the story of a rich fool 
or the wise and the foolish builders or the shrewd man. When Jesus wanted to teach us about the Christian life, he said, let me tell you the story of the good Samaritan, a tale about two sons. So friends, let's acknowledge that over and over, time after time, Jesus told stories. Well, I mentioned that today because I'd like to begin this sermon from out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'd like to begin it with a story. And it's a story that Jesus told earlier back in Mark chapter 4. It's the story of the sower and the seed. You see, today in Thessalonians, Paul talks all about receiving the Word of God. But before Paul ever taught about receiving God's Word, Jesus laid the groundwork for that. He laid the groundwork by telling us a story of the sower and the seed. So friends, this sermon today, it has three basic points. They're all found in your outline. The first one, as we've already mentioned, is about the reception of the Word. The second one, the work of the Word. And the third one, the message of the Word. But let's begin today by zooming in and talking about the reception of the Word. Let's revisit verse 13, and then let's talk about the story of the sower and the seed. Friends, this is what the Word of God said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God. And thank you for your patience with me as I turn these pages, because it's going to take me a little bit longer than what it would if we were inside. But friends, this first point, we are talking all about the reception of the Word. And did you hear what Paul just said to those Thessalonians? It was great news. He was saying that he and Silas and Timothy had preached and proclaimed the Word of God to these Thessalonians, and they had received the Word for what it really is, the Word of God. And this truth was so encouraging specifically to Paul. Do you know why? Because Paul knew that when preachers preach the Word, it's not always received well. In fact, sometimes it's received very, very poorly. And friends, this is where we see the story of the sower and the seed come into play. Because in this story, Jesus teaches us how people receive the Word. In fact, He says there's four types of reception that people have when they receive the Word of God. So let's talk about this story. You know, in the story, Jesus is using a farming uh, illustration, a farming story, and he talks about the sower who has a handful of seed, and he walks about tossing the seed out. And Jesus says it lands on four different types of ground. First of all, it lands on the hard path. Secondly, it lands on the rocky soil. Thirdly, the thorny soil. And then fourth and finally, it lands on the good soil. Well, let's talk about each one of those. When the seed hit the hard path, what happened? Jesus says that the birds immediately came and devoured it up. You see, the ground did not receive the seed. It stayed on top. And the birds came by and took it away. And there was absolutely nothing to show. But secondly, how about that rocky soil? You see, when the seed entered that soil, the Bible says there wasn't wasn't much soil at all. So a shoot sprang up immediately, but it didn't have any room to form roots. And when the sun came out, the Bible says that that shoot was scorched by the sun. And because it had no root, it withered away and it blew away it didn't last at all well how about the third soil the thorny soil 
The Bible says when the seed went into the thorny soil and it tried to grow, that the thorns surrounded it. And the, 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 the verb here is that the, the thorns choked the plant. And it yielded no grain whatsoever because of these thorns that wrapped around it. But then there's the fourth soil, the good soil. And when the seed went in that good soil, it was accepted. And not only was it accepted, but it produced a grain. And it grew and increased. How? 30, 60, and 100 fold. So that's the story that Jesus tells at the beginning of Mark chapter 4. But then, as I mentioned, a few verses later, Jesus comes back and he explains what this story means in a spiritual sense. Jesus says to us that the seed in that story, it's like the Word of God. And the sower is the one tossing out the seed. The preacher, in this case, Jesus Christ, it could be a preacher today, the one who is tossing out the seed, the Word of God, and so that it goes forth into the world. But the ground, those different types of soil, friends, that's the heart of man. And we see that the different, just as the different types of soil had different reactions to the seed, the different hearts of, of men have different reactions to receiving or not receiving the Word of God. Let's talk about that. First of all, the hard path. The hard path is talking about the hard heart of man. And when the seed of the Word of God hits the hard heart of man, the Bible says it's immediately taken away by Satan because the man's heart is hard towards God. And this man immediately turns to something else other than God. And in the first century, he turned to pagan practices or idol worship. But he completely rejected God. Satan took the word away. Well, what about the second soil, the rocky soil? You see, when the seed of the word goes into the heart that is rocky, Jesus says that the word of God is hindered because the rocky heart, that's a person who has what I call Easy believism. Think through this with me. This is the person who on the outside has the appearance of knowing Jesus. Just like that shoot went up and, and we, we thought it had life. There's this appearance of life. But if you look down underneath the shoot, you find there's no root. And if you look in the heart of this man who received the word in rocky soil, listen, there's no root of faith in his heart. He has the appearance on the outside to the world. I know Jesus, but when you look at his heart, he's not rooted in Christ at all. He is rooted in himself. And I want you to know that just because he appears to have a faith, the Bible says it's a phony faith. And friends, this is what the Bible means when it talks about apostasy. Have you heard that word? Apostasy. That's those who seem to believe in Christ for a time. But there's a point in their life where they turn away from Jesus Christ. What are some biblical examples of this? Think through it with me. How about Judas? Judas was one of the twelve. Judas followed Jesus for three years. And on the outside, he might have had appearance to the world that he knew God. But in his heart, there was no root of faith. And he did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. How about the Old Testament? I want to give you one of the most minor figures in the Old Testament. And that is Lot's wife. Do you remember Lot's wife? Abraham had a nephew, Lot. Lot had a wife. We don't even know her name. The Bible calls her Lot's wife. Why is this important? Did you know in the Gospels Jesus said, remember Lot's wife? Why would he say that? Why would he pick such a minor character and say, remember Lot's wife? It's because the seed that went into her was on rocky soil. She had this appearance of believing in God. In fact, she was surrounded by all the blessings of the covenant. But you know what? She never believed. She never had a true faith in Jesus. That's why Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Thirdly, we remember those, that thorny soil. Friends, this is the picture of the seed of the Word of God going into a, a man's heart that is 
thorny. And in this case, the Word of God is choked, the Bible says. It's choked because this man has so many thorns in his life. What are those thorns? Though Jesus says it's the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. It's the desires for other things. What's the example of this? In the Bible, it's the rich young ruler. The man who was in love with his possessions, but he didn't love Christ. There were so many thorns in his life, and he rejected God's word. Well, friends, up to this point, of the three that we've talked about, there's been a rejection every time. You see it, the hard path, the rocky path, the thorny path. But then we get to this last one, the good soil. Jesus says that when the Word of God goes and hits the good soil in someone's heart that has been prepared by God, it is received and it is accepted. And even more than that, it produces much fruit. And the example, of course, is these Thessalonians. Look no further than the Thessalonians found in verse 13 of our text because their hearts had been opened by God just as Lydia's heart was opened by God in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And Paul says in the Word today that if you look at their life, they're producing fruit. You'll recall Paul has already talked about this fruit earlier in chapter 1. He called it a labor of love a work of faith, a steadfastness of hope. And now he talks about their loving reception of God's Word. Friends, I want you to know that when these Thessalonians received the Word of God, God Himself was bringing forth the increase. As 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, Paul says, I planted... Apollos watered, but who brought forth the increase? It was God, and it was God alone. Romans 10, 17 says it this way concerning the word of Christ. He says, consequently, faith comes through hearing, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And let's recall what God had done with Lydia in Philippi right before Paul gets to Thessalonica. God had opened her heart to receive the word, and that's exactly what he did with these Thessalonians. He opened their heart that they might receive God's word. Well, friends, how might any of this apply to you or to me today? You know, let's take a step back and ask some questions. Maybe start with this one. How have you received God's word? Is your heart is your is your is your heart hard like that path? Has Satan taken the word away? Have you turned to other practices, other pagan practices? Is your heart rocky? Maybe you like Jesus or like uh, maybe you like Judas or like Lot's wife have only the appearance of knowing Jesus and this, there's this shoot that comes out. But as life goes on, Friends, do you find yourself falling away from the faith? Do you find yourself like Judas or like Lot, having no root of faith in Christ? Thirdly, is your heart full of thorns? Do do the cares of this world, the possessions of this life, keep you, hinder you? Like thorns wrapping around you, do they stop you from coming to Jesus as they did with the rich young ruler? Or finally, is your heart full of good soil, soil that has been prepared by God, not only to receive the Word, but to produce fruit in Him? What a story, huh? I mean, think about it. Who would have thought that a story about a sower and some seed could teach us so much about receiving God's Word. Friends, ponder that story. Ponder those questions. But let's take one step forward because we've now talked about the reception of the Word. So let's move to the second point today. Let's talk about the proof of that reception 
And that second point is simply the word, or excuse me, the work of the word. If you have your Bibles, look back with me at the last phrase of verse 13 and all of verse 14. The Bible says, speaking of the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as as they did from the Jews. I want to reread the passage I read from Isaiah just a moment ago, and I want you to really listen carefully for Hosea, well, God is speaking here. Isaiah writes, God is speaking. But listen for how God says that his word will always be at work in believers. Listen to this. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Friends, what's Isaiah saying here? Isaiah is saying God's word, it will never, ever return void unto God. It will always, always be at work in the lives of believers. And friends, that's exactly what Paul sings happening in the lives of these believers at Thessalonica? Well, we might ask the question, what's that look like? How is the word at work in the lives of these Thessalonians? Well, verse 14 answers that question. And again, thank you for your patience as I turn my page. What does verse 14 say is the proof that the word of God is at work in the Thessalonians? It says, you Thessalonians... You showed that the Word of God was at work in your life because you imitated the churches in Judea who were being persecuted. You imitated the churches in Judea who were being persecuted. Now, what does it mean to imitate? What does it mean to imitate? Well, it simply means that you do what someone else does. Here's a story for you. I remember several years ago when my daughter Macy was a little girl, and she doesn't know I'm going to tell the story, so now she's, she's frozen right now. But when she was a little girl, we would go in the backyard, and maybe I was, I was playing basketball with Brock or, or whatever, and she wanted no part of that at all. She did not want to play ball. She said, Daddy, will you play with me? I said, Sure, Macy, what do you want to play? And she says, Daddy, I want to play Simon Says. Will you play Simon Says with me? And I said, Absolutely. Or, uh, um, I'm sorry, not, not Simon said. We played Simon says, but in this case, follow the leader. I'm sorry. I, I'm getting my childhood games mixed up. Sorry. Follow the leader. Will you play follow the leader with me? I said, sure. We'll play follow the leader. And what she wanted to do, she wanted to be the leader, and she wanted to walk, and she wanted me to follow her, and she wanted me to do whatever she did. So if she waved her arm, she wanted me to wave her arms. If she jumped up and down, she wanted me to jump up and down. If she did a cartwheel, no, I didn't do that. But she wanted me to. She wanted me to imitate her through playing follow the leader. Friends, to imitate means that you do what someone else does. Well, Paul in this text says that the word was at work in these Thessalonians. How did he know that? Because they imitated the churches in Judea, and those churches were being persecuted. Think back with me, if you would, to the book of Acts about the persecution that those early Judean churches experienced. And by the way, if anybody knew about the experience of of the young Judean churches um, having persecution, who was it? It was Paul. It was Paul. Because let's remember something. Before he was ever Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was the one making havoc. He was the one persecuting these Judean churches. 
Acts chapter 5, it talks about the persecution that was going on in Judea. It says that the apostles were arrested, they were put in jail, they were flogged and sent away. Acts chapter 7 talks about Stephen, though he was falsely accused, brothers and sisters, he was stoned. And the apostle Paul, who was then Saul, he was not only there, he was consenting to his death. Acts chapter 12 says that Herod killed James, and after that he arrested Peter. They were persecuted. They suffered. But right here in this text, Paul tells these Thessalonians, one of the reasons I know you're a believer, one of the reasons I see the word at work in your life, is that you imitate these Judean churches. That just as they were persecuted, you were persecuted. Friends, do you remember the persecution of the Thessalonians? We read it a couple weeks ago. Acts 17, it says the Jews formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar. They dragged Jason out of his house in Thessalonica because Jason was hosting the missionaries. And they fined him and they threatened him. And Paul and Silas had to flee under the cover of night. There was persecution. So I want you to see, friends, that the persecution, the suffering that these Thessalonians went through, it was not only proof they, that they imitated the Judean churches. It was proof of their discipleship. It was proof that they really knew Jesus. It was proof that they persevered in their faith, that they were steadfast, that they were committed no matter what. And do you see how this is the very opposite of what we just talked about. We talked about that rocky soil, right? We talked about the seed going in, the shoot coming up, and there's this appearance of belief that, that you believe. But that's easy believism. Because when the sun comes out and the wind starts to blow, what happened to that shoot? It blew away because there was no root. But that wasn't happening with these Thessalonians. Man, they were rooted. Because when persecution came, man, they were standing strong in the Lord. And Paul saw that in them. And he says, you know what? I know the Word of God is at work in your life because you persevere, you're steadfast, you're committed, you're not blowing away. You see, the soil with the Thessalonians, it wasn't rocky. It wasn't hard. It wasn't thorny. It was good soil. God had opened their hearts, and they were producing fruit, yes, 30, 60, even 100-fold. Indeed, the Word of God was at work in their lives. Well, once again, let's reflect. Let's ask this question. How would any of this apply to you or to me? Well, friends, let's remember what the Lord Jesus Christ says about those who want to live a godly life in Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says to us, Blessed are you when others revile you, when they persecute you. For just as they persecuted the prophets that were before you, they will persecute you as well. In John chapter 15, Jesus says it this way, A servant, he's not greater than his master. If they persecuted Jesus... They will persecute you. Friends, what that means is if you choose to live boldly for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have a work of faith, a labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, you will be persecuted. You will suffer for your faith. Now, friends, we live in a nation, unlike many places on the earth, where that persecution is not nearly as bad as other places on the earth. And we're grateful to God for that gift. But indeed, I want you to know that if you live for Jesus, you should expect a type of suffering and persecution in your life. Remember, the servant is not greater than the master. And if the master was persecuted, so will the servants be as well. And I want to teach this point. When that happens to you in life, if there's ever a time of, surf of persecution and suffering, don't be surprised when it comes. 
Don't say, wow, I can't believe this is happening to me. Listen, Jesus said it happened to the prophets. It happened to him. It's happening to these missionaries. If you want to live a godly life in Christ, you will be persecuted. Well, friends, let's look at, finally at our third and last point today. We've talked about the reception of the word. We've talked about the work of the word. Let's look finally, brothers and sisters, at the message of the word. Let's re- reread verses 15 and 16 from our text. The word of God says about the message of the word. Who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has come upon them at last. You know, friends, even though the Apostle Paul was a Jew, and even though he was once a Pharisee, he actually chooses in, this, in these two verses to speak rather boldly about his own people, the Jews. And he tells them that God's wrath abides on them. You know, a moment ago we talked about Stephen sharing that sermon in Acts chapter 7. Let's think back about that sermon for just a moment. You know, Stephen preached this beautiful, redemptive, historical sermon where he starts appealing to all the Old Testament saints that had gone before him. He talked about Abraham, Joseph, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Solomon, and the prophets. But he tells the Jews in that sermon, even back in the time of Moses, the Jewish people rejected Moses. Think about that, he said. And then... In Acts chapter 7, verse 52, he talked about the prophets and Jesus. Here's what it says. This is right in the middle of Stephen's sermon. He said, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Did you hear that? In that sermon, Stephen told the Jews, The prophets were killed. Jesus was killed. And friends, that's the message of the word. That's what the Bible has to say to us. That these prophets and and Jesus were both killed, but it doesn't stop there. It says that missionaries, as they go out to proclaim the word of God, they're going to be persecuted. That was currently taking place right in Thessalonica. That the gospel would be hindered. And ultimately, many would fall under the wrath of God. Friends, this is the message of the word. Friends, with all that in mind, I have one quote for you. This is from a commentator that I use as studying for this sermon. But he kind of puts all this together, especially around the wrath of God. Listen to this. He said, Paul did not hesitate to point out that for those who refuse the salvation offered in God's word and provided at such cost by God's Son, there can be only divine wrath in the final judgment. God's wrath equates to the just and violent punishment that will be inflicted from heaven on all who persist in sin and unbelief. And according to Paul, Those who persecute Christians and the gospel have already begun experiencing the judgment of their unbelief. Paul uses the present tense, and he sees their hostility to the gospel as an advance installment on the punishment that is yet to come, for God's wrath has come on them at last. Can't you imagine being Paul? I mean, this is a bold statement to make in the midst of your own people the Jews. But I want you to know that it was also Paul who maybe more than anybody else at the time who understood the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that we can have through Jesus Christ. Hey, let's never forget 
Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus to persecute other people, was confronted by Christ. God opened his heart. And Saul trusted Jesus and became a believer and became the apostle Paul. Paul is the self-proclaimed chief of sinners, and he could testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ like no other. And he would testify probably something like this. Even though I was the chief of sinners, even though I despised God, even though I persecuted the church, and specifically he despised Jesus because he had a lip service to God as a Jew, but he despised specifically Jesus. Even though that happened in his life, God was so gracious and so merciful to Paul that he drew this man, the chief of sinners, to himself and created good soil in his heart that Paul might indeed come and receive Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And by the way, that's Paul's message in the Bible. He implores us all to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Well, friends, as we close this morning, as we ponder the Word of God, as we think about the reception of the Word, the work of the Word, the message of the Word, I hope you can have some takeaways today. Let me put these takeaways to you in forms of questions. First of all, coming back to this question, how have you received the Word Think about one of the greatest stories that's ever been told. Think about the hard, rocky, thorny, and good soil. Which one is your heart? Are you like the rich young ruler? Are you like Judas or Lot's wife? Or are you like these Thessalonians who say, Yes, man, I want to receive the word. I want my heart to be open to the things of God. Secondly, How is the Word at work in your life? Does your faith imitate that of the Judean churches? Does it imitate the life of those in Thessalonica? Think about follow the leader. Follow the leader. Is the Word at work in your life as it has been in those who have gone before you? Is our faith steadfast? Do we persevere even through times of suffering and persecution? Do we realize that the servant is not greater than the master? And just as they persecuted the prophets and Jesus, we too will be persecuted. And then finally, do we acknowledge the message of the word? The message that both the prophets and the Lord Jesus were killed that many are trying to hinder the gospel, that missionaries continue to be opposed, that the wrath of God is ready to be poured out and is even in the lives of those who are already rejecting Jesus. Dear friend, if you find yourself in a place where the wrath of God is aimed at you right now, I want you to know there's a way out of that, that today is the day of salvation, and the way out is the way himself which is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Today, friend, if your heart is hard, rocky, or thorny, I pray that God softens that hard heart, that He removes the rocks, that He takes away the thorns. And I pray that God opens your heart as He did for Lydia, and that you embrace Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And friends, I want you to know, If you want to be saved, you can be saved. Jesus has paid your price. Come to Christ today. Pray with me, please. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for what is a very special time as a church. I think every single one of us are going to remember this day. The first day that we ever had an outdoor service on our campus. And oh God, I pray then uh, more than remembering about the wind blowing or sitting in chairs or, or, or listening to a long-winded pastor uh, on a windy day, I pray that we would remember, remember your word, specifically the story of the sower in the seed. God, may we ponder all four types of soil and really examine where our hearts are within that story. God, may we ponder 
uh, the work of the Word, that it should be at work in our lives. Lord, are we imitating the churches in Judea? Are we imitating the Thessalonians? Lord, I hope so. And I pray, God, that you would develop perseverance and steadfastness in us that we might imitate and show forth that, yes, we really belong to you. And then finally, Lord, help us to remember the message of the Word, the message that um, is so difficult for many to hear, yet so true, that the prophets were killed, Jesus was killed, missionaries are persecuted, the gospel is hindered, your wrath is coming. But, Lord, there's a way out, and that way is Jesus. And I pray that everyone, under the sound of my voice, would run to Jesus, the only one who can protect us from the wrath of God that is to come. We ask all this, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The song we're about to sing is called Christ is Enough. And in one part of the song, we actually sing the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me and the world behind me. And so please stand with us as we sing this together. Christ is enough. Here we go. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. There's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free, and Christ is enough.
Friends, it's been so good to see you and be with you this Lord's Day. Receive now the benediction of our God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Christ is enough for